Uh, this is week 10 of a uh, hectic and um, very unusual quarter. So thanks everybody for making time. And also thank you um, to Professor Sarah Roberts for joining us today. It's week 10 for you also. Um, so I'm gonna go uh, just into our official introduction here. Uh, Professor Sarah Roberts is Associate Professor of Information Studies at UCLA and co-director of the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She's an expert in the areas of internet culture, social media, digital labor, and the intersections of media and technology. She coined the term commercial content moderation to describe uh, the job that paid content moderators do to regulate, uh, oh, sorry, that paid content moderators do uh, to um, manage uh, content shared on social media platforms. Uh, Roberts's book, Behind the Screen Content Moderation in the Shadows of Social Media was published by Yale University Press. It's the first book length ethnographic study of CCM. And this work was also featured in the 2018 documentary, The Cleaners. Um, this is theoretically rich, empirically grounded and politically vital work. So please join me in uh, thanking and welcoming Professor Roberts. Thank you. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, this was a long time in coming. Uh, a talk delayed by some of the uh, unfortunate circumstances in which we have found ourselves and our world in the past uh, in the past year. So Roderick, thank you especially for um, for hosting me and I hope to return the favor soon. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. I can't see you all. Uh, but I'm going to imagine um, a lot of awesome people that I can't see right now. So uh, I, I, I'm going to give a talk today that uh, really, uh, I, I endeavor to do a couple of things with it. Uh, I really want to, uh, in addition to kind of sharing the findings of, of, uh, of this research, uh, I want to talk a lot about its genesis because I think uh, that is a story that, uh, at least for me, holds um, holds quite a bit of interest uh, in terms of, you know, for those of you who may be in a doctoral program right now and are trying to uh, establish uh, some terrain to to uh, to launch your research agenda. Um, I like to be pretty transparent about about the ways in which uh, studying a phenomenon that is designed to not be seen. Uh, Pre presents a, a series of, of challenges uh, that um, uh, you know that are I think worthy of, of discussing. Uh, you know how how does one go about that, and what is the impact of um, of finding what is not to be found? So uh, that's kind of a little uh, a little context for what I want to share with you. Uh, as was mentioned, the book. Uh, the book length version of this research uh, that also goes into the, what I'll share with you today about the front end of it uh, was published a little over a year ago by Yale University Press and I'm, I'm thrilled to say a, a new edition uh, of it in translation came out in, in the uh, French language market uh, this October and it's, uh, it's done quite well there where you can find books like that at the um, you know, French version of Barnes and Noble, and you can't really find this one there. So I appreciate it. Um, what I'm gonna do is, is take you back in time a little bit as we, as we begin today uh, by sharing a few headlines from just a couple of years ago. Uh, this could be any number of headlines. I just happened to grab these and put them on a slide. Uh, it, it is now the case here as we sit in 2020 that I when I give, talks about this research, I don't feel compelled to have to start at, at zero to explain uh, commercial content moderation because for the very reason of what I'm showing you here, the fact that this has now become a phenomenon that graces uh, or disgraces in some cases the front pages of, of world media outlets. Uh, it, is, it is the stuff of, of conversation among uh, among my family members, for example, and it's not just because they know me, it's because they uh, are aware that there is an adjudication process that exists on social media and that further that adjudication and decision-making process is important in some very tangible ways uh, to understanding in aggregate the ecosystems that we inhabit as users and that we uh, experience uh, as consumers of information, news, 
other kinds of media questionable uh, of questionable veracity at some times uh, and and you know really live a great deal of our social political civic and <laughs> obviously under covid uh, business or professional lives so uh, if ever there was a time to think about how those ecosystems come to be and uh, and to, to whose benefit I think I would argue that it is now um, it is now critical that we start speaking about this so this um, the fact that that content moderation is a concept and a phenomenon that is uh, th that can be apprehended by regular folks who read the news is actually uh, a, quite a quite a sea change and uh, oops um, this 2017 uh, headline grabbing attention really is in contrast to where we sat some years before and and I want to take you back to that time so uh, it's hard to believe that 2010 was a decade ago, but in fact it was. 2010, I was uh, completing my first year of studies uh, alongside some uh, new, new graduate school friends at the University of Illinois uh, Graduate School of Library and Information Science. It's now just uh, the iSchool at Illinois. I had made some new friends in the program that year. This one person called Safia Noble was a new friend of mine, really close friend. You may have heard of her around the way. I don't know if you have. Uh, and uh, and Actually, she and I were TAing together that summer in, a, in an introductory class, and it was on a break from that TA gig that I had to sustain myself for the summer that I was sitting with, you know, a really uh, nasty burn latte from Espresso Royale and reading the New York Times. And it was, you know, just kind of a thing that I was quickly uh, uh, basically scrolling through on my laptop on a web page. And I came across an article that spoke about, uh, you know, a, a, like a text section article. We're not talking front page, a small article that spoke about some people who were working uh, in rural Iowa. And I'm sitting here, you know, surrounded on four sides by cornfields, the cornfields of central Illinois. And then there's like this anomalous university town in the middle, middle of it. So I'm sitting surrounded in this agricultural area reading about just a state over in very similar conditions to where I'm sitting, that there is, for all intents and purposes, what seems to be a call center. And the call center there in rural Iowa was set up not to answer, you know, uh, washing machine service calls or, you know, how do I get my internet online where people call up and speak to a human being. In fact, there were no phone calls going on at all. What these people were doing, according to this piece in the New York Times, was uh, being on the receiving end of a flood of material coming from these nascent social media platforms, from websites that allowed user engagement or user uploads of material, from text-based uh, engagement forums on news sites and so on. Essentially, any outlet that uh, endeavored to have people engage with it and submit material uh, had a similar problem. And it became clear to me uh, at that time, just by thinking about it, that uh, what a what a potential liability this could be for a firm from uh, the standpoint of just like PR gaffes. And if we go back to look at these headlines, you know, that's really what gets on the front page. It's when there's um, something uh, in, in the nature of content that should uh, should not be there and is shocking or that should be there and gets removed and people are incensed about those things. But back in 2010, there wasn't a whole lot of thought going into uh, number one, the fact that uh, there were things that were being removed or that there were things that were being purposefully left up after being evaluated. In fact, at that time, I had already been on the internet for almost two decades. I had been using the social internet since 1993, and then I had a 15-year career in, in, in IT, and I thought I was pretty savvy, not to mention uh, having completed my first year of PhD studies at Illinois, which of course made me an expert on just about everything, right? Uh, that is a joke. Uh, it made me pretty clueless and I'm still trying to catch up. But anyway, um, you know, at that point I thought I was pretty sophisticated and I knew pretty much all there was to know about social media and its production. And it, it you know, just in reading this brief article, which described the working conditions for these workers, low wage uh, kind of contract based uh, or, or limited term non-secure non work. 
uh, working as third parties, not working directly for companies that need, but working as a third party, essentially outsourced firm and doing so, um, you know, on the receiving end of what could essentially be an endless flood of material, material that had already been determined by users as having some kind of uh, objectionable content, I realized, of course, somebody must do this. Because in 2010, I knew enough about computing to know that the state of the art really was not uh, up to snuff in terms of being able to make any kind of meaningful decision around the nuance, symbolism, cultural import, uh, language or region specific meaning and so on of the kind of material that these people were seeing. And then furthermore, the article went on to describe these workers as uh, in some cases experiencing symptoms of, of essentially of trauma uh, because of what they were seeing and that this was becoming an increasing concern. So now we have this very disturbing admixture of low wage, low status work hidden away and outsourced uh, away from the origin point as well as the, uh, the intended audience point of the material, um, workers working really as unskilled or semi-skilled laborers and, uh, and doing so, the article said, in secret. And I knew it was in secret because here I was surrounded by some of the brightest minds in, in digital media studies and in information science, uh, in, in computer science and so on. And this had never been a point of discussion so um, for those of you who are graduate students uh, on the talk, I just want to say this is like one of those aha moments. This for me was an aha moment because I couldn't stop thinking about what I had read and the problem that I knew it had to present uh, for, for the internet writ large. But just to verify that this wasn't a, a commonly known practice, uh, I, I went to my friends, I went to my colleagues and peers, and I went to my professors and I asked them all, you know, I kind of gave them the, the lowdown and I asked them all, have you ever heard of this practice? And 201, all, from all different walks of life, different places in the world, different points along their career, each one sort of took a pause and they said, huh. And they looked at me and said, well, don't computers do that? Now, it was fascinating to me, first of all, that no one had heard of this practice uh, as an organized uh, kind of um, quasi-professional, at least for pay work. But the second thing that was fascinating was that upon reflecting just for a few moments on the problem itself that, that was posed, everyone guessed that computers were somehow doing it. Now that to me indicated um, not that these people were naive or stupid or somehow didn't, uh, you know, weren't experts of, of, of their own sort, but that there might be a reason for them to believe, believe that. Maybe they were being led to believe that somehow tacitly or, uh, or inherently, but I wanted to just double check this. So I walked over to, uh, you know, the, the more uh, highly resourced part of campus, which at uh, the University of Illinois is the north side of campus. This is where you'll find all the engineers. You'll find the, um, the uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications or NCSA, which gave the world among other things, Telnet and gave us uh, NCSA Mosaic, the very important uh, graphical web browser whose code was then um, usurped and, and put into Netscape and the rest is history. So I went over to this NCSA building and I met with a research scientist there who uh, had, I guess what I would describe as a visualization cube. It was one of these rooms all blacked out on all sides, uh, soundproof. He had controlled all the environmental parameters in the room uh, for research purposes. And uh, I, again, I, I kind of stated the problem to him and I asked him for his reaction. I said, is it possible right now here in, in this moment of 2010 that computers could be dealing with this problem at scale without, you know, without humans? And he kind of looked at me and he was kind of chuckling at me. This is the first time I had a different response, in fact, to my question. And he gestured behind him at a big like rectangular oak table that was sitting in the middle of the room, really nondescript, kind of boring, not ornate at all, just big wooden, wooden table. And he said, see that? And I said, yes. And he said, well, right now what we're working on in this visualization cube is trying to get the computer to reliably know that table is a table. So this is National Center for Supercomputing Applications. This is um, 
uh, the state of the art and this is what they were working on. Now that was 2010, okay? That was a decade ago. So I wanna be fair. Things have advanced immeasurably since that time, but it's important to understand this origin point and the state of uh, what was possible through computation at that time to then understand and make the case for the fact that the phenomenon of human adjudication of content online was in fact a necessity if adjudication were to be undertaken at all. In other words, he pretty much laughed at the notion that there was any kind of significant way to reliably adjudicate visual content, never mind moving images or other kinds of more complex things uh, through uh, computer vision, basically at that time. So this put me on the path. It put me on the path to, to ask some questions about, okay, if this is a phenomenon that must be in fact necessitated by the social media industry's uh, own needs and its needs in this case being the ability to control what flows over its, its branded platforms if for no other reason than to maintain and manage their relationships with their true customers who are of course advertisers, right? Um, if, if they have a need to control what, what stays up on their platform and I've learned that there's really, it's really not possible at this juncture for computers to be majority or, or solely responsible for that function, then it's down to human beings who do this. And as I, as I thought about it more, and as I thought about that, that short piece I read in the New York Times, and I thought about things that I had errantly clicked on over the years, over my many years on the internet, starting in 1993, when you used to have to take images and string them together uh, knit them together uh, using an application so that you'd have a full file to render the image. Uh, things that I'd seen that I wished I had unseen, I thought um, that this was something I had to pursue to find out what would it be like? What is it like? What Under what conditions are people laboring where they're seeing this material pretty much endlessly uh, coming from unknown sources and, and destined for other sources uh, where they are the intermediary point and yet, based on just my anecdotal inquiries, almost no one knew about them. And that meant that almost no one knew about the practices that the social media platforms were undertaking uh, and the norms by which they were asking these people to make the decisions. So it was really like, uh, the way I describe the, the feeling I had was a bit, and here's where I'm gonna be out, totally out of my league because I know next to nothing about astrophysics, so just bear with me. But it's my sense that in the study of something like space uh, where so much is imperceptible, something like a black hole becomes known because you can notice the things that orbit around it and you can tell by their behavior and you can tell by a change in the gravitational pull that something is there to be noticed and, and, and that, is a, that is a powerful phenomenon, even if you can't see it. And that's the feeling I had when I started thinking about and theorizing this phenomenon of commercial content moderation, meeting the adjudication of social media and web-based content for pay by primarily human beings, sometimes augmented with computation, sometimes not, uh, and the working conditions under which they labored, which was under non-disclosure agreements and secrecy. I was sitting in a cornfield in, in Illinois. I was drinking a cup of coffee and you know, really things were never the same again because I was obsessed with this story. Sent it to all my friends. A couple of my friends were like, you already emailed me that article. I saw it already, you know, that happened more than once. Uh, my colleague, Ergen Balut, who is a, a, himself a political economist of, of, uh, uh, of the digital and uh, was also a grad student at that time. He's one of the people who's like, you showed me this already. Um, and, and so I started to pursue it. Now I have to say, I was a graduate student. I had no money. I had no research budget. I had a car and I knew that uh, the, the company that was featured in the New York Times article was just a state over in Iowa. And so I thought that potentially I could make my way over there and try to find people to talk to me. Now this is an important part of the story because this was actually a total dead end. I reached out through a variety of means 
to try to recruit people to a study where I could come talk to them about their work. And I got absolutely zero response. Uh, and I tried over a long period of time and I tried in a, a bunch of means that you know I won't go into. But the point is it became clear to me that the most likely explanation was after that story ran, uh, there had to have been a media clamp down. And I'm sure that the workers were told, don't you dare go talk to the media again about what we do or how we do it. And certainly don't answer some uh, graduate student from Illinois uh, questions. Uh, she seems innocuous, but don't talk to anyone. So I got nowhere uh, with that. And it was a real dead end and a disappointment. But in the meantime, I was doing everything I could to find evidence of the phenomenon in that way that I just described the black hole, you know, looking for gravitational pull of other things, looking for traces, trying to find um, business to business solicitations for work that seemed to me like this phenomenon. And it went under all kinds of different names. There wasn't one single name. This is why I came up with this concept of commercial content moderation, both to differentiate it from other forms of earlier governance that had to do with volunteer work where um, you know, there might be a, a person in a social media community who was uh, elevated in status and could uh, tangibly and visibly uh, engage in, a, in community management. We see that model to this day on platforms like Reddit or Discord or Wikipedia and so on. But that this was a totally different practice. And, and I, it, it was clear to me, you know, non-disclosure agreements, secrecy, uh, not saying who, uh, who had uh, brought the contract to the firm, all of these things were, were at play. And I knew it was gonna be hard to get anyone to talk about it. Importantly, I could find no trace of discussion of this phenomenon from the firms themselves. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, nobody seemed to be talking about what happened to content after a user might file a report or an objection. They didn't admit to it at all, in other words. So me, in, meanwhile, while I was trying to get to the folks in Iowa, I decided to visit the website of this company that was discussed in, uh, in, in the New York Times article. It was a company called Calaris. Obviously, that's you know one of these made up goofy corporate names that doesn't mean anything in particular. Uh, and I went to their website. And again, this is another word to the wise, screenshot it, okay? Because it's, it's not gonna persist. Take some screenshots. I took the screenshot. The company has changed hands. It's changed names many times. And what they certainly no longer have on their website is this incredible splash, splash screen image of a bucolic Iowan farm. I, I doubt this is in Iowa because that looks like corn to me and they grow soybeans, but okay. You know, kind of your your, your um, iconic, idyllic family farm, red barn, silo, and a slogan that says it all, in my opinion, outsourced to Iowa, not India. And I said to myself, now what is really for sale at Calaris? What's actually the commodity that they are providing to business? Well, I think that slogan gives us a pretty good idea. They were providing a set of presumed values uh, a, a, a set of presumed racial, physical, gender perhaps, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, socioeconomic, et cetera, demographic values and categories. Outsourced to Iowa, the, the, the corn fed, people looking like me, I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm, uh, you know, these are probably my cousins over here in Iowa, you know, people who look like, like me, a couple generations off the farm, right? They don't want me to work for them, but you, you get my drift. And not to the other, right? The racialized other, the accented other, the other in India, the other somewhere else in the world. And yet, through this, you know, essentially, com completely, in my opinion, racist slogan, xenophobic slogan, Iowa, the central uh, heartland of, of the United States is in competition with, at, on a socioeconomic level, India, right? It is identifying in, in India as its competition, not Illinois, not Wisconsin, India. So I found this fascinating. Um, you know, as I said, I never got to talk to anyone from Calaris and it was a letdown. But 
a couple years into my research, after I started sharing this story and sharing this image, they followed me on Twitter. And that was weird. <laughs> and they never engaged with me. And, you know, I had not that many followers on Twitter and suddenly Calera started following me. So that was, that was nerve wracking. Uh, you can see down here, they tell us about a clear dialect, right? Customer care skills and so on, customer satisfaction. That's what they were selling. They were selling Iowa to the world. So that brings us to commercial content moderation. Again, at, at, as I was sort of um, dead in the water trying to find actual people to talk to, I was looking for evidence in other places. And so I went to the front end of the process. I went to the interfaces that one encountered uh, when trying to report disturbing content as a user on the platform. And one of the first places I went to was YouTube. This is a screenshot uh, from some years ago. It doesn't really look the same anymore, I don't believe. But what this does do is give you a good indication of the kinds of material that someone on the other end of this process would likely see and be asked to adjudicate. So here you, um, as a user, would encounter a pull-down menu, really a logic tree, kind of flow chart logic uh, flow of, of material. So here the, the user has selected, yes, I'm reporting this because it's violent or repulsive content. Then the user dips into a, a second menu that uh, comes off from the first and is asked to, again, triage or sort or categorize uh, on that next menu the type of violent content he or she has seen et cetera. And finally, at the end of the logic chain where they are categorizing the content that gets sent off somewhere. And there's really not much of a, uh, an indication on the front end at all of what will happen or what expectations a user could have after doing this. Uh, but these were the places where I was looking for traces of the activity uh, in lieu of being able to actually talk to workers. Uh, although uh, that it was actually uh, to come down the road. When I started the work, uh, the scale of content was at one place. And now when we talk in 2020, we have to talk about that exponential growth and scale. So when I started uh, looking at YouTube, for example, they were providing a statistic of about receiving around 100 hours of user generated content per minute, per hour, per day, et cetera. 100 hours per minute. By about 2015 or so, that stat that they were publicly giving was up to 400 hours per minute. They stopped providing that statistic easily in a kind of user accessible way at some point. But I think that collectively we can imagine that it has only continued to increase. And so here's where I would introduce this notion of scale and vastness of scale as one of the incredible points of tension uh, with relation to the adjudication of content that was going on uh, by these human beings and sort of the endlessness of the process. There's really never a time, in other words, that you would kind of come to the end, you'd be out of things to review. Uh, but again, at the same time, while we kind of think about what that scale indicates, it means that there's only a small subset a small fraction of a percentage of material that actually ever is reviewed, right? And in the early days of commercial content moderation, when it was almost entirely reactive, meaning almost entirely responding to a user-generated uh, abuse complaint, uh, those were the only things that were, were being seen. That has changed a little bit now where there's more proactive uh, ways of seeking so-called bad content that usually is uh, where computation comes in. But you know, there's sort of a question of, of harm, of level of harm here in the sense that uh, you know, if there's a piece of content that's sitting out on a platform and nobody's ever engaged with it or clicked on it and it's horrible, is that the same thing as there being you know, a, a, maybe a less abhorrent but still disturbing piece of content that millions have seen? And so this is, uh, this is not always a calculation that's easy or obvious to make. It's sort of, you know, if a tree falls down in the forest kind of problem, right? <laughs> so one of the things that I found early on in the research too, as I was poking around, was that um, 
there was actually not one kind of monolithic process going on with regard to workers who were adjudicating content uh, on behalf of platforms. It, the first encounter I had, of course, was with this call center environment. But quickly, I learned uh, through my research processes that this work, again, going under different monikers and kind of different descriptions sometimes, was happening at a number of sites. It was actually happening at four major distinct kinds of uh, uh, industrial sites that I could that I could uh, identify. The first, and, and you know, this is sort of a, uh, this, uh, this chart sort of indicates a, a bit of a hierarchy in essence of, uh, of uh, status and pay and uh, longevity of, of, of connection to uh, the employer in, in essence, but that's not um, universal. So just keep that in mind. So first of all, we have in-house commercial content moderation where there are people who actually go to the headquarters, uh, the same places that the engineers, the product managers, um, the policy folks, et cetera, go to. Uh, and they work on site there uh, alongside the, the others in the same physical space, although it, it came to light that they often had a differential status and might have been being employed as contractors, which I'll talk about in just a couple minutes. Um, the second site that I found was a bit interesting. It was a boutique setup where there were firms that were starting to pop up that were specializing in social media management soup to nuts. So it was not only would they provide a service taking down objectionable content for you, but they would also seed content. And I'll give an example of that. This was primarily a service that was being offered to companies that were not in the technical domain or didn't really see their social media management uh, uh, function as central or primary to their industry. So this was a company that, you know, this was a, a, a system set up so that a company could come in and sort of take over the Facebook page of say Oreo cookie, or, you know, take over uh, the Twitter feed of, uh, of Steakums, right? And do something with, uh, with those things that the companies would necessarily feel they were savvy enough or invested enough in doing. Believe it or not, um, Oreo cookie did have a Facebook page and uh, the problem with having a Facebook page is, or, or any place on the internet is, as one executive once very bluntly told me, if you open a hole on the internet, it gets filled with shit. And so you open a page for Oreo cookie, do people come and wax on about how much they love Oreo cookies? No, what happened was they opened their, their page for Oreo cookies and they'd have comments like, Obama's a Muslim, kill all the gays. All right, that's not what Oreo cookie wanted associated with its brand. So their boutique management firm would come in and delete it. But then there was nothing there, it was a tumbleweed. And this is where the seeding of content would come in and they would maybe go in there and write, gosh, my kids just love to eat Oreo cookies on their, uh, on their lunch break home from school. It's a wholesome treat for the whole family. I, I love giving Oreos to my kids. All right, something like that. Trying to spark discussion or, you know, the Steakums example on Twitter where it's a pretty, um, funny, goofy feed and people follow it just because of the humor and the kind of absurdity of it. I've seen these boutique firms over the last few years kind of get bought up and eaten up sometimes by ad agencies, but there are still a few really big players in this market that have persisted. Third, we have call centers. We've already talked about call centers and everybody here is most likely familiar with call centers. So I don't want me to go into that too much, but I think what's important to say is that um, the traditional call centers that, that took voice calls and did work like that really had a lot of infrastructure that lended itself to uh, this kind of work. Uh, they had the physical operations, they had the labor force, they had probably the digital, uh, the digital phone lines and other kinds of uh, internet pipe coming in uh, that would handle such things. And uh, they were located worldwide so they could deal with the 24 by seven nature of social media, uh, especially in other parts of the world when one part of the world went to sleep, the other part of the, the world would be working uh, on these issues. And so uh, using call center third party labor was starting to be used in concert with some of these other strategies to kind of have that coverage. Finally, micro labor websites. We've all heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk most likely here. There are a number of other similar sites where when I started poking around and looking around, guess what I found? Solicitations for doing uh, content moderation by any other name 
uh, sometimes with warnings that the content might be disturbing or uh, adult only, and uh, contracts being offered for as little as one penny per, per screening of, of an image. So it's really that digital piecework concept where the uh, employment the employment relationship between the solicitor and the person providing it is instantaneous and there's absolutely no uh, responsibility on, on either side for a sustained relationship. I think uh, kind of being mindful of the time here, right, Roderick, uh, we want to probably leave a little bit of time. How, how am I for time here? Well, you've been talking for 35 minutes. So okay. I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 more minutes and then some questions. Yeah, great. That's just about right. So um, now I'm going to go into what actually happened when I found the people. So after, uh, after some time kind of spinning my wheels, but using it to formulate and kind of theorize about the things I was finding again, kind of feeling my way around, you know, the celestial body that I couldn't quite get inside of uh, through a, a, a number of, of ways and, and uh, means, I was finally able to get in touch with some workers who were willing to talk to me as long as I could grant them uh, protection from ever revealing where they actually worked and for what firm, never using their names um, never using uh, traceable details about them. And this was because those workers, again, were under non-disclosure agreements. Uh, I call the company in my work Megatech, and uh, it, that's not its real name, of course, but just an interesting anecdote that you might, that I frankly find pretty funny. Over the years, I've had occasion to be at various events or, or what have you, where there are people from industry, from the social media industry present. And there's often like little gatherings afterwards or like informal talking or whatever. And it probably more than six times, I've had people come over to me after a couple sips of wine. Okay, let's be honest. They come over and they kind of slip up on my side and they'll say to me, kind of look around, they lean in and they're like, we're megatech, aren't we? We're megatech. I've had like six different companies say that to me over the years. What did that tell me? Wow, you all have the same problem and you're all trying to solve it the same way. Hmm, pretty interesting finding, unexpected finding in an unexpected place, uh, but that always amuses me. And of course, because I am bound by uh, the, the, the research ethics that I signed on to, what can I tell these folks? But, you know, which is super un, like super frustrating for them and very satisfying for me. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's like something I never expected and it's been pretty, uh, pretty amusing over the years. Megatech is in Silicon Valley, that I can tell you. It uh, is one, it, it's a major player. It's been around for a while. And uh, I was able to connect with some workers uh, who are at different stages of their tenure at Megatech working as commercial content moderators. Because of the, of the fact that they were at different kind of timelines in that experience, they had some really interesting insights, um, you know, based on uh, how long they had been doing the work. But uh, interestingly, they shared some similar characteristics that I can tell you about. Megatech insisted on hiring only people with four-year university degrees. Uh, these were people who, like other employees at Megatech, were expected to come from elite universities, uh, flagship public universities such as Cal, um, maybe private universities of, of high repute such as USC or others, maybe private liberal arts colleges uh, that uh, also had a great reputation. Uh, all of those schools also had another thing in common, which was a pretty fantastic price tag for tuition for a four-year degree. And um, another similarity among the employees was that they all had the, uh, the, the very poor foresight and misfortune of majoring in silly things like economics or history or literature or, um, you know, Spanish language gender studies, you know, the kinds of things I took in college, maybe you did too, right? So, uh, you know, they didn't have the, they didn't have the STEM degrees, right? 
and they were never going to be considered for the jobs that required those degrees. When they found that they were being considered for jobs at Megatech, even though it was through the auspices of being hired as third party contractors, they were uniformly thrilled. And the reason they were, as they reported to me was, hey, since I graduated, I was living back with my parents in LA and that's not it, I couldn't stand it. Or I was only getting part-time work and I was having to string together my jobs. I was working as a barista, I was delivering pizzas, et cetera. This was, this was a, a, a theme, um, a, a refrain, if you will, that I heard all the way back to the first experience I had reading about the workers in Iowa at Calaris, who when asked by the newspaper reporter from the New York Times uh, why they would persist in such a job said things like, hey, the job I had before this was a stalker at Walmart, right? So these economics, these greater economic pressures, the downturn in the economy that the students were experiencing that, and at that time, the um, almost, I, I think, fetishism around the notion of STEM as, as the only viable or valuable uh, uh, endeavor that one could undertake professionally. All of those things contributed to making these jobs look great. And so they took them and they took them with, without knowing very much at all about what they entailed until they went through the process of training and then getting on the job. How would they know if you know, the, the, the best minds in the room at the universities and, and elsewhere in industry didn't know either. So uh, of course that was the case for them. That having been said, it was, it was a baptism by fire, right? It was very quick to learn that um, this job was difficult, that it would entail being confronted by some of the uh, worst aspects of human self-expression, I think we can say. And again, I wanna, uh, I wanna make a point here about method and about thinking about research for all of you in, in that path in the room that uh, one of the things that was very important to me when I spoke to these workers was to never ask them a question like, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? And the reason was twofold. One, um, I didn't want to, to, to press on that, that painful place for these workers, to ask them to conjure that up in their mind. That wasn't, uh, that it felt exploitative. It felt like something that if it were to come up, it would come up organically through other conversation and that would be adequate. Uh, we could certainly figure it out just by looking at, you know, how we report the abuse, like I showed you before, violence, child sexual exploitation material, uh, harm to animals, self-harm, uh, other kinds of gross out or gore material, et cetera. Okay, so we don't need to ask them because we have a list of those things that they saw. They were the things that were, were prohibited. But secondly, I think there's a, you know, this is a little more abstract, but I think there's power in all of us taking a moment of self-reflection, closing our eyes and asking ourselves, what's the worst thing I could see? What's the thing that I, I'm phobic about or I'm scared of? Now imagine for a moment that that thing is the thing you're confronted with every day. And then you get a sense for what the, what the ask was for these workers. Uh, Max Breen was one of the first people I talked to and he put it this way. He said he can't imagine anyone who, who does this work who can just walk out at the end of a shift and just be done. He told me you dwell on it whether you want to or not. And so there wasn't really an effective way, even though he, he was a worker at Megatech who went on site, there was no effective way, right, to put up a barrier between the work that he did and sort of mentally remove that or check out when he went home. Now, interestingly, Max was someone who told me, hey, I do this work because I can handle it. There were people here, they lasted two weeks, they were out. I've been here for almost two years, I can handle it and I do it so you don't have to see what I see. But you know, I don't really have any ill effects. And then a few minutes later, Max said to me, um, you know, I've been drinking a lot since I took this job. I drink a lot at night when I come home to kind of come down. And he also told me a little while later uh, that he had been sitting one night with his partner on the couch and they were, you know, kind of getting uh, she was getting a little amorous with him and, you know, coming on to him and she, he was sitting with her and he was reciprocating and suddenly he had something pop up in his head from something he'd seen at work that day, just like an image popped into his head and his reaction 
was to physically push her away, you know, stiff arm, like a football player, pushed her away, distance between her and him as she was uh, being romantic and sexual towards him. And she, she, you know, was shocked by it. And he was a bit too. And he said, I couldn't even tell her what I saw because I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to sully uh, that by telling her. And yet you can see the repercussions went not only to Max, but, you know, it, it had a secondary or even tertiary effect here on his partner. Um, I think the, the last couple of things I want to say is that, you know, this, all of this was against a backdrop, a backdrop of, of a lot of promise uh, for this, this new uh, knowledge society, the society that through its, uh, uh, through its technological, uh, scientific, and uh, service sector work, would take many people out of the 20th century manufacturing jobs that they held in the United States and elevate them from the shop floor. I say this as someone who comes from a family where my grandfather spent 45 years on, a, on the same line at the same factory. Uh, that, you know, this was uh, this, this move towards the knowledge society, of course, for those of us in information science, we know the history of our field. It comes from, uh, in, in large part, uh, the, the scientific race during the Cold War as, uh, as uh, many of these uh, digital and other kinds of innovations were being used towards, um, <laughs> towards uh, maintaining American, uh, American empire and power in the world, particularly against the, the, the Soviet Union and its bloc, but also with regard to other places. But the point was is that many early theorists of this kind of new knowledge society thought that this would provide a deliverance uh, for, for people. And certainly I can't argue with, with the fact that commercial content moderation work doesn't put you in harm's way in the way that working in a tool and die shop might or in an assembly line might where you could lose a limb, um, you could have a finger crushed inside machinery you could have a lifelong physical harm or disability uh, from the movements that you sustained over time. Sure, those things are not um, those things are not on offer in this work. But I believe that uh, through through my findings and through other kinds of uh, mechanisms that have reported on these stories in the past year, we can make a pretty serious case that there's other kinds of damages. Uh, that and harms that can come from this work of the of the psychological variety. And what's most frightening to me is that we don't have any kind of longitudinal study. There is no information um, or real means to follow people who've done this work uh, on the long term to understand what what it looks like when you've done the work, but you've left it. And now you're back doing something else two, five, 10 years on. I've spoken with a woman who worked at a, a little company called MySpace in LA. Ever heard of it, right? MySpace, it was a thing. And she was the first person there to run their commercial content moderation group. She ran it and she trained people. This was over 10 years ago that she left the company. She's a bookkeeper now. And she told me when we met, uh, again, a, about a decade after she left, she said, well, you know, for the first few years after I left MySpace, I wouldn't shake anybody's hand. And she kind of looked at me knowingly and I thought I knew what she meant, but as a good researcher, I asked her to say more about it for the record as we were recording our conversation. And she said, well, you know, I know what people do because I've seen it and people are nasty and I don't want to touch their hands. These are the kinds of things that, um, that I found in my research, right? Meanwhile, what was the Knowledge Society going to do for all of us? It was going to put us in swimming pools, give us that leisure time, right? The machines would take over. It would give us time away from work. Um, it would, I guess, put us at a swimming pool with all white people. Also, interesting, interestingly enough, right? Um, but it would, you know, it would deliver us from from the forty hour work week. It would give us leisure time. Well, I'll tell you one little anecdote here. My grandfather worked on the line for forty five years. It was hard work. It, it actually, I believe, killed him from lead poisoning. Although he lived a long life, but you know what he never did? He never checked a goddamn email after five o'clock. All right, so think about the ways in which instead of shortening that workday, we've actually made the workday endless. How many of you are coming to me live from home? We don't even have a barrier anymore between our workplace and home, right? So I would argue that actually through other uh, pressures, 
neoliberalization, uh, other kinds of uh, forces that encountered this move towards uh, the knowledge society that we've actually seen uh, some really deleterious and unintended consequences, perhaps unintended, perhaps intended in some cases. Um, I think I'll leave it there because uh, we're at time and I wanna allow a little bit of time. The last few things I'll say, I had the opportunity to follow this story and follow this practice uh, because I found, as I said, that it was global. And so it wasn't sufficient to kind of look at it at the United States only. I traveled to the Philippines and I will be the first to admit that uh, you know, I'm not an expert in that part of the world at all and I had to um, really learn a lot. But what I can tell you is that, um, you know, I came across this, this fantastic map of trade routes and I was fascinated by it for the fact that you can see uh, it's, it's highlighting routes to and from the United States to, to the Philippines. And if we were to follow the trajectory of data flows uh, through those undersea cables that we learned about through Nicole Staryoleski's book and through the work of Lisa Parks and others, right? If we were to follow those, those undersea cables and that infrastructure uh, today, the routes would look disturbingly similar, right? To this kind of colonial era, United States domination of the Philippines economically, militarily, and, uh, and culturally, right? And so when we see ads in the Philippines for commercial content moderation, we're told things like Filipinos have excellent English skills, understand Western slang. And in fact, we're told all Filipino people have a great eye for detail, terrific, um, making them perfectly suited for content moderation work. I would just put that in relief against the backdrop of a century of American domination of the Philippines prior to that, the Spanish uh, colonization of the Philippines and say that this practice of commercial content moderation is actually an overlay on some very old and very worn practices that are predicated on, uh, on empire. And I think I'll leave it there, Roderick, and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave it and maybe open it up. So thank you very much, folks. Thank you. That's uh, wonderful, Sarah. I'm trying to find my applause button here. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to collect all the kudos that you were due for your thank talk. You. I want to see some more of those. Thank oh, there they go. OK, I don't know if you can see them, but you're, you're getting the. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing my screen because um, I want to like hang out with everybody. Uh, there we go. There's everybody. Hey, okay, are, are you seeing your applause? Yes, thank you. And I'm seeing oh, I'm seeing some friends. I'm seeing Bo. Hey, Bo. Um, some other folks here that I know. Wonderful. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I find it really challenging to give talks on Zoom. I just want to acknowledge that because, you know, there's a lot that we get from the energy of being in a shared space together and like just emoting to each other. So it's really hard. So thanks for hanging in there with me. And, because... and the wine. We don't even get any wine or dinner or anything. Right? <laughs> this, is some, uh, this is some BS, man. This is some uh, Knowledge Society BS. All right. I, I owe you a sandwich. How's that? Yeah, I, cool. I owe you a sandwich. Well, let's get a let's get a cocktail after after COVID. <laughs> okay. So uh, I I typed in the chat that if you want to ask a question, you can type it in the chat, or if you want to use the raise hand feature, um, you could use the raise hand feature. Oh, I, I see a question already. I'm just going to read it to you here. Thank you. So Grace asks, uh, Grace says, thank you, Professor Roberts. I was wondering through your research, were you able to determine if there is anything that companies are doing or something we can do in the future through technology to alleviate the psychological stress put on content moderators? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I would say that um, there has been a shift in industry to being mindful, let's say, of the uh, the effects, the ill effects that this work can have. Whereas uh, a number of years ago, when I first started looking at this, it was really like a revolving door. It was like, um, you know, disposable workforce, really. And uh, through pressure, through, uh, you know, through uh, unflattering, let's say, news reports and research and other kinds of, of, of pressure points, uh, there has been some improvement in that regard. You know, some firms do things differently. There are, there are some firms that, that do direct hiring and they intend to keep people on for the long term and they pay them well. 
but um, the big companies are really guilty of not doing that. And, and I, I go back to the issue of scale. The scale being what generates their incredible revenue, right? Uh, the scale being the thing that they're able to sell to advertisers. They're not, they're not willing to scale it down. And so therefore they, they have this need, this constant need for more and more people. And there's just not enough people in the world to moderate all the content, right? So they're constantly gobbling up people. Um, in some of their centers, they've done things like add uh, mental health professionals, let's say, of different types, not necessarily psychologists, but other kinds of therapists or counselors. They've, they've done some of that. Uh, although I will tell you that uh, the workers I've spoken to over the years have been skeptics and they've said things like, yeah, we have a counselor who comes in every two weeks and then, you know, is like available in our conference room but it means that I have to, you know, log off of the, of the response queue, which my manager will see, get up and in front of all my coworkers walk in to talk to the shrink, which signals to everyone that I'm having a problem doing the fundamental thing that I'm called on to do, to do this job well, which is to be able to handle it. And so, you know, they have pointed out to me that that is like, it feels like window dressing sometimes. Um, Another case happened where there was there were counselors on staff, but it turned out that those counselors were feeding back to management. Uh, I don't know if direct, you know, directly attributing things to specific employees, but they were feeding back information uh, about employees' wellness or lack thereof to management, and that felt like such a breach of trust that the the whole thing was destroyed. Uh, in terms of like technological things that that can be done, interventions. You know, there are some things that, that work and that work better than others. And, and as this subfield has grown as, as, and, and as people, as the interdisciplinarity has sort of coalesced around looking at commercial content moderation as a phenomena, um, some researchers who are skilled in these areas, many of whom may be in the room, um, who, who, who can build tools and who can build interfaces and so on, have tried to think about uh, how can we give uh, moderators interfaces that diminish the harm? So there's some things that are actually very simple that have proven effective. Things like rendering imagery in black and white, especially when it's gory. So like instead of seeing blood red, you can tell it's blood, but somehow black and white diminishes the, um, the, the, the nature of it somewhat. It, it means sometimes taking a video and, and putting it into component thumbnails so that a person doesn't have to watch an entire video. They can quickly glance at the screen and see some uh, problematic uh, stills in thumbnail form. So they're smaller and they're just frozen and make a decision on those grounds. Uh, and there's ongoing research in this area. I'm actually on an NSF grant right now with my colleague Libby Hemphill from the iSchool at Michigan, who is, you know, really skilled in, in, in these arenas. And what I'm doing is providing data from interviews with uh, commercial content moderators that we just did last month to help inform her tool building. So we're trying to do that. Uh, but one thing I'll say is uh, if you talk to anyone in industry, there is like no likelihood that humans in the loop are going away anytime soon. And so anytime you hear something to the contrary, please be very skeptical and don't, don't believe the hype, right? That's wonderful, thank you. There's actually three more questions. So there's two questions from students in the chat, but first, uh, Professor Ruberg, it looks like. Bo, do you, do you have your hand up? I do, sorry. Oh I don't, yeah, please. I don't mean to cut the line in front of our students. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Sarah, that was wonderful. I really appreciate you speaking. Um, I have a, a question, it's a slightly selfish question. So I'm part of a large research project that Wendy Chan is working on it, Simon Fraser, creating AI to address toxic content online. And I think one of the things I'm really curious what you think about, because I have a hard time wrapping my head around it, is what it would mean to create AI that can address problematic content that doesn't just get put in the hands of the large corporations that you're talking about. And if there's any possibility for an AI intervention that is on the level of users or like is not about creating tools for corporations to repurpose? Yeah, I love the question. Um, I think 
uh, Professor Crooks let you jump the line because I'm going to be meeting with students after, so they'll they'll have another crack at it. Um, so don't don't uh, worry. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's a fascinating uh, angle, and I'd love to talk with you more and and Wendy too. So let's let's connect. Um, but yes, I mean that is a huge piece because uh, to allow users more control over what they see and experience on, online is of course hugely empowering. But one of the problems we have, I mean, we, we're, you know, this is what I try to remind folks when we have these kinds of conversations is that so much of what we all do, I include myself in this, in this, um, in this group, is to try to solve a problem that is predicated on a business model that we are taking for granted. Um, so it's predicated on things like the place that all of us are engaging is uh, a platform that operates globally and at scale and in, you know, to, to immeasurable size that we can't even fathom, right? So that, and, and it's doing that to generate advertising revenue. So one pitfall I see in what you describe is going to be bumping up against that model that has all sorts of restrictions on what users can do and not do with the platform with their API, which again, you know, the, the ability to, to use those kinds of tools has shrunk over the years. It's more and more restrictive. So is data gathering, as, as I'm sure many of you know. So, uh, you know, we're always like held hostage by the, by the business model. And so some of, sometimes what, I, I think it's brilliant. I think that's an awesome idea. And I would love, just as you would, you know, plugins, more decision making on the front end, more ways to filter my content so I don't have to deal with certain kinds of things that are harmful to me as a user and as a human. But I worry that under, you know, if the, if the object is to deliver eyeballs to advertisers, which it is, anything that we do to intervene upon the, the company's ability to control that, they're going to have a problem with most likely. So that's where there's like the flaw in the business model. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be nostalgic, but man, I'm from another time when the BBS was literally in a guy's closet in Iowa City. Speaking of Iowa, once again, we were on a social media platform. I see some nods of the old heads in here. You know, our social media platform was a massive BBS, a global BBS of 10,000 users. Can you imagine? 10, managing 10,000 users at one time. Um, and it was like a mess already. And it was text only, you know? So, um, but one thing that we had was um, the ability to intervene in some of the ways that you're describing or the ability to speak back to the power structure on the platform. We identified who the policy makers were. We knew who had the power to delete or leave up. We knew how to appeal those things were tangible. And if you so chose, you could spend your whole time in that social media space just like fighting, fighting the power because that was, a, that was a, an activity you could do. Uh, but we know that what has happened with, with megatech, you know, the megatechs of the world is that it, it's almost like dealing with a nation state at this point um, or you know, extra sovereign layer where it's um, opaque, where Democratic processes are abridged or non-existent, where um, the the processes that exist in in what we've you know what we've come to understand as our nation-state model are like ignored completely because cyberspace is just everywhere, man. Of course, it's not. It's sometimes it's in Iowa City in a closet, and so. They have gone as far as to, you know, not only do they have their own legislative bodies at this point or policy outfits, now they're building their own Supreme Courts or their appellate courts. And so it's like this extra layer of governance that's going on that's completely undemocratic um, or, or sort of like just enough to fool you. And I think one of the problems with this model too is that, you know, again, I'm going to, I'm going to call on our, our, shared discipline or one that we're all very adjacent to, which is we've seen the rise in these kinds of uh, engagements in social media as we've seen a foreclosure on true civic spaces, true public good, true ability. Uh, you know, we've seen decimation of, uh, of the public school system in the United States, of public libraries, um, 
abridgment of, of those spaces and places where people could truly gather and engage. The, you know, anybody ever been to a, a city council meeting? It's not fun, but it's a thing. It's a forum you can go to and engage and, you know, be a part of. And uh, as we've seen foreclosure on those things, it's not like people are less interested in being informed. So they go to these other places that masquerade as the town square, you know, that have fooled them. And so I love the idea of, of what you brought up, but then I always hearken back to this issue of like, what if we you know, is there still room? I have to believe there is. There's still room to flip the script on this being the only way to do it. So that's where I sit with that. But I want to know more about what you are, are up to because it's awesome. It, I'm sure it's only awesome if you're telling me those are the folks involved. Thanks, Sarah. I'll send you an email. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Professor Roberts, there's two more questions in the queue. We're over time, but would you be willing to answer them still? Sure, sure. That's thoughtful, thank you. So yeah, um, and then we'll Cass, go to hang out with students. Yeah, Cass um, asked, Cass actually wrote a very thoughtful question here, but says, thank you, Professor Roberts. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about content moderation as a tool of marginalization. Obviously content moderation is necessary, but I'm concerned that recent discourse about making the internet safe is wielded against sex workers, often trans women and women of color who are economically vulnerable, a la Sesta, Festa and the moral panic over online child porn and child sex traffic sex trafficking more generally. My thought is perhaps making the process more community centered rather than a corporation making decisions from above, but that doesn't strike me as profitable, uh, but, uh, which is what this is really about, in which case, how do we encourage it? Yeah, thank you, Cass. Really timely thoughts, because as many of you may have heard just yesterday, MasterCard and Visa uh, will no longer process payment for Pornhub. Um, which is a bit like shutting the barn door after the horses have gotten out. I mean, I feel like they've done all right uh, uh, profiting from um, pornography and it's like kind of silly. It's, it's like a silly gesture. And of course, um, these decisions, both around content moderation of social media and around um, this, this really interesting point that's a bit tangential but related of payment processing and money exchange, uh, which are also really policed and abridged for, for sex workers, uh, whether or not the, the work they engage in is, is legal, quasi-legal, or deemed illegal. Um, they are over-policed, and uh, they have their uh, ability to use platforms like Cash App and Venmo routinely abridged. Um, like kind of under moral panic reasons. And I was just talking to a reporter this morning. I was like, that, so are we going to see MasterCard and Visa like stop, you know, processing payment for the NRA? Oh, no, we're not, huh? Hmm. Okay. So, you know, it, yeah, of course, it's, there's a moral panic here. And the moral panic has been in place since the graphical web became a, a, a concern. So, you know, the predominating, uh, a uh, legal regime that allows for commercial content moderation in the first place in the United States is Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which was absolutely legislation in response to kind of wave 1.0 of um, the moral panic about pornography online. Wendy Chun, one of the pioneers to write about that, and, and she speaks about that in her work, um, and it was really influential to me. So. You know, when we understand commercial content moderation to be a function of brand management, which is really what it is, with knock-on effects of protecting users, um, I think we get, you know, it's a more cynical view, but it's actually a more correct view because the Communications Decency Act of 1996, uh, Section 230 of that act says that companies actually can't be held liable for what gets transmitted over their over their networks or channels or platforms. This is an antiquated kind of anachronistic law. At the time, they were talking about internet intermediaries that meant walls of modems that you would dial up to to go on to online somewhere else. Uh, and now it's you know Facebook, YouTube, and, and other platforms that are media entities in and of themselves. But um, the, really the exception to that rule is uh, child sexual exploitation material which oddly enough is often um, something that does respond well to uh, proactive computational tools of an automated removal. And that's a whole other thing that we can get into. But um, 
bottom line is that you cannot divorce commercial content moderation from number one, brand management for the platforms to manage their business to business relationships with the advertisers. And number two, from a profit motive. And when you keep those things in mind, I'm gonna tell you that sex workers are not gonna be the winners. Trans people are not gonna win. People of color are not going to come out on top and down the line, right? Marginalized people, people whose, whose, whose appearance and bodies and ways of being in the world are, are marginalized and considered non-normative -norm are not going to fall into favor under such a model. Instagram, one of the biggest offenders in this area for removing pictures of, um, you know, that are not necessarily sexual or maybe sometimes it might be, but people of size, people of color, LGBTQ, queer imagery and so on. And it's very frustrating too, because that's one of the main places that people use, you know, Tumblr was a huge outlet for a lot of people and it, it disappeared. So the, you know, the, it's, it's the profit model. It's the, it's the business model. And it means that, you know, a lot of people on this, on this talk right now are not going to find their identities reflected positively in those regimes. And I think sex workers are often the canaries in the coal mine. They are treated um, with disdain by social media platforms, which is ironic since the porn industry is what has dr driven a great deal of innovation in, uh, in, in social media in general. Mm. Um, thank you again for being generous with your time. The last question is from Professor Beats. Um, do you want to unmute Matt? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for a great talk, and this is so interesting. I wanted to think a little bit, or I was I was struck by a sort of playing in my head the the when you were talking about two different streams. One was sort of the outsourcing aspect of do the labor that goes on, but also thinking about sort of the psychological harm that can come to the people who are doing this labor or the potential for that and their well being. And one of the things I kind of thought about was other places where harms are outsourced. What, what popped into my head was where, you know, we send old ships to other, to, you know, poor countries in order to be, to sort of push that risk away, to hide the harms. Do you see that happening in this space? Is that, is this a strategy for that? Or is that one of the drivers of this? 100%. And then I'm also kind of wondering if that, you know, I'm thinking also about some of the attempts to, for example, hold companies feet to the fire about labor laws in other countries when they're doing that. And I'm wondering if there's been any sort of similar movement for not just maybe pollution or psychological well, or pollution or child labor, but also around psychological well-being. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're totally on the, on the money with that. And, you know, no pun intended, you are, you're hundred percent bullseye. Uh, I consider this practice, this phenomena uh, to be in a, a larger production chain that starts, you know, quote unquote elsewhere, right? It's, it's other places from where we're sitting and talking right now. Uh, it starts with digging out minerals in a, you know, in a mine in Central Africa where it is a, a war-torn area that is an unsafe place for many people. It goes to the manufacturing processes of, of, of the material equipment that is needed to be in the cloud, right? The material objects like, you know, like this, this phone that I need so I can be ubiquitously computing or I can be wireless, right? With this thing. So it goes to that. It goes to the shipping and logistics. It goes to um, uh, on the other end, uh, you know, then we've got kind of the commercial content moderation that happens in between user to platform to world. We've got that in there. And then of course, on the other end, as you point out, we've got waste. We've got dismantling, we've got discarding, you know, this, I, I got this phone, I think in, in February, I'm, I'm led to understand that it's obsolete now. I need to get the new one. You can't really see it, but it's it's not 5G. So it's, I guess, trash. Um, 
it's got to go somewhere to be broken down, right? And guess what um, happens in the Philippines? Well, in the Philippines, uh, e-waste gets sent there too. It gets sent there too. I have a piece that I wrote that starts out with the story of a of a garbage barge, literally a garbage barge that came from uh, British Columbia that was quote unquote recycling. Uh, so this guy had a company in British Columbia where he was, um, you know, doing like industrial recycling for like adult diapers, you know, biomedical waste and other stuff that can't just get thrown out. And he boxed it up in some containers and put it on a container ship and sent it to Manila. And uh, the Port Authority in Manila got onto it and they wouldn't let it come into the Philippines because they were like, we're actually not going to take your garbage anymore. Like we're not doing it. Um, so it's going to sit here in port and whatever happens happens, but we're not taking it. And there was, you know, it was like kind of an international incident. Uh, but meanwhile, other garbage is flowing to the Philippines, right? And it's in the form of, of this, it's, it's in the form of this unwanted material, again, unwanted in the eye of the beholder, but nonetheless unwanted. And um, there, there is a resonance there and there is a connection there. Um, and it has meaning and, and it's important to recognize it. And we cannot think about these phenomena as being you know, ethereal and divorced from a historical read either, right? A, 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 a historical and political take. I had the occasion just, I was running late to this talk because I had a, I met a wonderful student this afternoon who wants to come study for a semester at UCLA from Brazil. And he's looking at content moderation in the context of Brazil and, um, you know, how it's contributed to the rise of of a very frightening right-wing government there in Brazil. And we, we may have some people, uh, other Brazilian people on the call, but you know, this is a country that has experienced um, American hegemony and other forms that has led to military dictatorships, right? Like we have to know about these histories, the history of neoliberal uh, uh, economics moving from the fringe to the center and taking over politics. Uh, and pushing that out on the rest of the world, using the rest of the world to beta test these things and then bringing it home to roost in, in the US. I mean, I argue we're all beta testers, aren't we really, for these, these technologies and functionalities and practices. Um, anybody get a check cut to them lately for like your content moderation work by reporting? Yeah, me neither. Well, um, there was a lot of questions. Obviously, people really wanted to engage with you about this material. It's a really great way for us to end our speaker series. So thank you again for coming today. Uh, right. And Have that's fun. it for the quarter. This is the last talk, uh, fall quarter. So I put a link in the chat and you can check there um, for the winter 2021 schedule that comes available. So um, we'll just end by giving uh, Professor Roberts her, 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 there we go, this proliferation of applause again. Thank you, so again, everybody. thanks everybody and uh, have a good holiday. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Thank you.